Bad Pack Broadcasting continues to bring you the best original sports content, but now you can get more of the content you love. For as little as $3 a month, you can get access to bonus content, including behind the scenes footage and interviews from the Sports Walk, Sideline Stories, or the Ain't Hard to Tell podcast. All this exclusive content comes via Patreon. There are tiered levels of patronage, and each Backpack Broadcasting patron receives exclusive perks. Your support helps Backpack Broadcasting create more of the original content that you love. Visit Backpack Broadcasting's Patreon page and become a patron today. Hard to Tell podcast, episode 126, Dexter Henry, Brian Fonseca, here, still living that quarantine life and still watching The Last Dance, absolutely enjoying it. And to talk with us a little bit about The Last Dance, uh, somebody I talked a lot of Chicago Bulls basketball with in my life. It's kind of always pertained or was around a little bit of the Knicks and him taking some shots at me with the Knicks. <laughs> uh, but this is a guy I've known for a long time. Good friend, Lance Meadow. He's Sirius XM host, also Giants, New York football Giants. Uh, radio host as well. Does play-by-play for a bunch of places. Columbia, uh, Westwood One, tons of things. Me and this guy go back because we used to do play-by-play in color for something called a high school basketball network way back in the day. Mm. My man, Lance Meadow. Lance, what's up? I'm doing very well, guys. First of all, thank you for having me on the podcast. I'm for looking sure. forward to reminiscing with you, Dex. Brian, it's certainly good to meet you and interact with you. And you're really going back into the archives, Dex. The <laughs> <High School Basketball, laughs> Basketball Network. I guess it's only appropriate that you have me on because if we're going to reminisce about the Bulls, we might as well reminisce about our own past as well. We, we, might, we might as well. We had a lot of good times, a lot of uh, good trips and, and fun stuff we've done throughout the career. Uh, so Brian and I have been loving this documentary. Lance, we, we've actually loved every part. We just finished parts five and six, as you did as well. What are your thoughts thus far uh, through the documentary? What do you think about it so far? Well, as you well know, I am on cloud nine. As a huge Bulls <laughs> fan, as a huge Michael Jordan fan, I've been anticipating, guys, this documentary forever. And it's not to convince you two, because you've been passionate about ba- basketball, you've followed basketball. It's more of the new generation that thinks the NBA started in 2003 and believes that the minute LeBron James stepped on the court, that's when NBA history began. So this is refreshing, hopefully, from that standpoint. That's a lot of my peers. I just want to point that out. A lot of my – because I was born in 94, right? So a lot of my peers, that that would be them. Yeah. Well, at least you were alive and well on planet Earth, Brian, when Jordan was winning championships. I'll give you some credit for that. It's <laughs> the people that weren't even alive. Oh, Yeah. By the time 1998 rolled around. And this, I think, is going to be a course for them. They got to get their pens, their pens, their pencils, their (laughs) notepads, you name it, out and take notes. But, Dex, getting back to your question. I've been enjoying it tremendously. I think it's extremely insightful. I love the structure of the documentary. I love the fact that what they're doing is they're using the structure of the 97-98 season to then flash back and trace the history of Jordan as well as profile a lot of other key members of that Bulls team. Because mm-hmm. as you guys notice, each episode, they've profiled Rodman, they've done Phil Jackson, Tony Kukoc, Scotty Pippen. So I think that's also a nice way to track how these players develop themselves and not just all of a sudden got to the level of what the Bulls were in that second 3 piece. Now, I want to ask you a question because you just mentioned something about the younger audience. In the first episode we did where we were kind of recapping this, we had some people, including Brian, who were a little bit younger. I was the oldest person, obviously, on the podcast. Um, and on Twitter, have you seen people that you may interact with you that are younger, maybe saying, hey, nah, Jordan wasn't that good from this? Or have you seen a lot of people who are younger, actually, they've been taking their pen out taking those notes and paying attention. Well, it's interesting you ask that question because I interact, unfortunately, with a lot of nuts on Twitter. I oh, should mention yeah. first. Oh, so, yeah. you know, we have to at least <laughs> teach them some lessons, something you guys certainly can attest to. Interestingly, I would say I have been hearing from a lot of even colleagues who were not growing up during the Jordan era of the 91 through 93, 3 and 96, 98. And 
they have, I would say, been turning the corner, where <laughs> they certainly have been acknowledging what Jordan did, first of all, his competitive drive. And I always say this, you can read books, you can look at box scores, guys, and you can learn an awful lot about the NBA and history. For example, I can learn a lot about Bill Russell and Will Chamberlain, and I would consider myself pretty read up on both of them, but right. I can't judge them to the same degree that somebody who lived during that era, who was able to flip on the TV, who covered them in the locker room, because there's something to be said about the eye test. And this is what I'm always arguing. And I'm sorry to go off on a tangent. That's no, fine. The Pistons, for example, the bad boys, everybody brings up, well, Jordan and the Bulls lost three times in a row. And he did. And they finally got over the hump in 91. But anybody who wants to tell me about the NBA is tougher or is just as tougher now, you have to turn on and watch those Bulls-Pistons game. You need to see what it was like to drive down the lane. You need to see what it was like for Jordan to be hammered every time he went to the hole. Guys, there's no box score that's going to be able to explain that. I don't care how many rebounds you tell me Dennis Rodman grabbed or how tough Isaiah Thomas was. You need to watch. And that's yes. what I think this documentary does. We're finally giving visual evidence to the younger generation who can't learn everything by just clicking through basketballreference.com and they could <laughs> be for giving them a plug right now for that. No, yeah, no, no. Well, I, I, I have to agree. That. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that 100% because I think this documentary is targeting those people of my generation that I was talking about earlier because this is, I mean, if nothing else, a reminder or to, you know, people around my age that, oh, we're, we have to teach you this because too many of you guys think LeBron is the greatest ever. Not that I do, but a lot of people of my age, you know, having been born when Jordan was on his way out practically, and then you're weighing in the fact that he played with the Wizards and we're still kids. And, you know, a lot of people don't have those sort of memories. And, you know, you're right. You look at basketball reference. You can look at all the stats and Kareem has the most points. And, you know, this person has this. But it's it's different than watching it. And what a lot of people are doing now with the Internet is they're not really watching it because they're just kind of going up, looking at stats, going on YouTube, looking at highlights and things of that nature. So, Lance, I agree with everything you said right there. Yeah, 100%. First of all, I'm happy to hear that you don't think LeBron is the GOAT because that would have been the end of the interview. No. Right? He's in the conversation. <laughs> he's, he, he's in the conversation. That's However, fine. I also don't think, I don't know why all of a sudden like people think that it's a two-man race. I think that Kareem should be in consideration. I think that Will should be in consideration. And these are guys that I obviously wasn't around for, but if you just look at the, never mind watching, if you just look at the accomplishments, then that's one thing. And then when you go and watch, because you could find you could find a lot of Kareem on YouTube, and I actually think we need a multi-part documentary series about him so that people of my generation could learn about okay. that. But he's another guy that is in this conversation for sure. 100%. I'm total agreement with you. I think there's a lot of guys that deserve credit from those previous generations before Jordan, and they should be acknowledged. The Boston Celtics and the Lakers rivalries and all the great players that came from that. There was actually a great 30 for 30 on that, yep. that I think a lot mm. of people should go back and revisit, you know, not to take anything away from the last dance, but I think they've put together a number of great 30 for 30s. And oh, yeah. it's good that finally players of those generations are getting their due. And what I mean by getting their due is they're getting their due from a visual standpoint and from a background standpoint. And that's what's great about this document. No, I, yeah. I, I absolutely agree. I, I want, yeah. Something came to my attention uh, that I wasn't aware of and last night. I wanted to ask you, Lance, did you happen to see Ken Burns' comments about the documentary? Did you, mm. catch, did you catch this at all? I did not catch his comments. So I'm going to read um, his comments. He is not a fan of the documentary. Uh, apparently, which was shocking to me because I'm a fan of his work Lovely. as a documentary. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, one of these are going to get through, Dex. You knew one of the, one of these comments were going to go into the ether. He said, <laughs> "If you are the, this is a quote, if you are there, influencing the very fact of it getting made means certain aspects that you don't necessarily want in are going to be in. Period. And that's not the way you do good journalism. Certainly not the way you do good history in my business." However, with saying that, Burns also revealed that he hasn't watched any of The Last Dance, which I find interesting <laughs> when people make comments like that, but they haven't watched something, and that he would, quote, never, never, never agree to do it because Jordan's production company is a partner in the making of the series. Um, yeah, I don't necessarily agree I have with that. On this for I'm sure. not also sure, Lance, as, as you and I have done this for a long time, and I didn't read all the stuff that my friend had sent to me. I had forgot to bring it up. It just crossed my mind again to bring it up for this podcast. But 
I to say that it's not good journalism is a bit strong of a take for me. Uh, there, I like you have loved the narrative of going as you mentioned, Lance, from going from using the ninety seven ninety eight season and then going back to different points, even the parts that have hurt my soul. <laughs> being a Nick fan, <laughs> I have enjoyed this, and so I, I didn't understand that. It's just completely different from what you said, obviously about you know your love of the documentary and and how you feel about it. Um, and I don't think you're biased because you're a Bulls fan, but I think Ken Burns, somebody who I have a ton of respect for and love his work, I, I, I can't rock with him on this one. Well, I'm trying to understand Ken Burns' point, and I'm curious your thoughts, guys, too, because based yeah. on what you read, Dex, yeah. my interpretation of what Ken is saying is, and if my interpretation is off, feel free to jump in, I think he's saying that he thinks that it's a biased perspective just through the lens of Michael Jordan yes. and that Jordan and his people are steering the narratives and yes. that there's not enough balance in that. Now, to counter that, mm -hmm. it seems as if they spoke to a variety of different individuals. They spoke to Sam Smith, for example, who is the one that wrote the Jordan, Jordan, Rules. Rule, the Jordan Rules book. Okay, so you know that book wasn't necessarily giving a glowing resume for Michael Jordan's sake, and that was covered immensely on the last episodes. You know, they spoke to Isaiah Thomas, who clearly has a different perspective from Michael Jordan in terms of how things played out with that 1991 Eastern Conference Finals. They have brought in a number of his rivals throughout the years, members of the Phoenix Suns, Charles Barkley. So, I mean, we're hearing from a number of people, guys, that have no association with the Chicago Bulls or no association with Michael Jordan. And plus... The gambling narrative has also been covered immensely, which was brought into play in this last episode. And I would say if there's any storyline that you would want to cover up or you're tired of hearing, it would probably be this that Jordan wouldn't be open to addressing. The other storyline, by the way, yep. would be yep. the fact that people criticize he shied away from weighing in on politics. Yes. Right. Yes. He was heavily criticized for that. So both of those controversial subjects, if you want to label it like that to a certain degree, have both been covered. The one thing I will say, if people want to get on, and I actually have defended him on my Sirius XM shows and I brought on guests, I, I think it's fair to say Jerry Krause does not get enough credit in this mm. documentary for the job he did in constructing the team around Michael Jordan. And I will defend Jerry Krause, and unfortunately, Jerry's no longer with, with us, us here. Right. However, Krause had his assistant GM, Jim Stack. He has had some commentary on this. And Bill Cartwright and a number of the assistants who I think have given Jerry Krause some credit. And I actually spoke to Tim Floyd, who yeah. was brought up in the documentary, who succeeded Phil. And Tim, to this day, and remember, Tim Floyd took over a team during the rebuild where there was an immense amount of pain. I know, Dex, you can't sympathize. <laughs> no, I can't. <laughs> no. I know. <laughs> but... He has every reason to say it was painful. We didn't like the moves. Looking back, regretted it. And he even defends Jerry Krause in terms of what he did to surround Jordan with talent and also, guys, construct a roster that was very competitive when Jordan retired. Let's not forget about that. So I would agree with Ken if he wants to point that out, okay? Right. I think that has some legs. The other stuff, if he's saying, well, Jordan and his people are steering the narrative— once again, I think we're hearing from a lot of other individuals that have no connection to MJ. I, right. I, I want to just harp on what you said, Lance, because I happen to agree with you. And I think that a lot of the things I actually thought they may not go to wear in this documentary was one, gambling. And two, as you brought up his foray into politics or speaking th against things in the black community that I did yeah. not think was going to happen. And the fact that they actually showed that in this documentary and went right at it. And Jordan actually talks about this. You know, it wasn't like they had uh, just other voices. They had him talking about it. I mean, they could have shied away from that if they wanted to, and they didn't. And so I actually applaud Jordan's team. Like, look, any of these documentaries with these players, they're going to have their hands on it. They want to sort of control the narrative. And I say that with quotations to be nice. I'm, look, they want to protect their image to a degree. But I actually look at this as Jordan is really putting himself out there. He knows what the gambling criticism was at the time in 1993. He knows what it was about the criticism that he still receives to this day for not speaking up a lot about politics. And I do think it's a little unfair to Jordan um, because there were a lot of other athletes who didn't do that as well. But I do think this documentary has actually touched on things that I thought maybe they would not have touched upon. Brian, what did, yeah. you, what did you think? 
And I think underlying all of that, you're not going to get that much Jordan access if you're not agreeing that he's going to at least have some kind of hand in it. Like you're not getting this level of person if he's not going to have some sort of producer control. Now, I don't think he's actually used that control because, you know, uh, it's even been said uh, by Jason Ayer, who's, you know, producing the documentary, that Jordan hasn't really tampered with any of the content. Like, yeah, they've gone back and forth, and he's probably made suggestions here and there, but he hasn't really, you know, shied away from the things, as you mentioned, obviously the political aspect, which I was surprised they actually brought up. Yep. And they went a little, they, you know, they revealed something that I didn't know because I didn't really know about the 1990, you know, that race in Chicago locally that he didn't speak out about. I didn't really know about that. I mean, how would I have, you know what North, I mean? North I was, Carolina. It was in North Carolina. North Carolina. Yeah. yeah. I didn't really know about that. And then, um, the Republicans buy sneakers to comment, obviously, you know, and that kind of thing. And that was brought up. But I think, again, if you're going to work with somebody of this caliber, you're not going to not let him get hands on it. Otherwise, he's not going to agree to do it. I think that's part of the transaction. And I think that Ken Burns should probably also watch it to see before making the criticism, because I think that maybe his opinion would change, especially if he gets to parts five and six, where they actually do touch on this stuff. Now, they could do it a little bit more. But at the same time, if you're Michael Jordan, you probably don't want to go so deep into that. And in fairness to him, we still have four more parts to go where we still have to get through the retirement. There's probably, I think there's going to be more gambling stuff that we're probably going to get into because they sort they somewhat hinted at that, especially in parts five and six. So I think we're probably going to go down that hole even more. And before this all came out, Michael Jordan did sort of say, look, y'all are going to hate me after this comes out. And yeah. I understandably, you know, I, I saw some of that already on Twitter after part five. Some people were turning on him already. And I'm like, yo, one, he kind of warned us. And two, I mean, this is not unlike some of the things that we already knew. It's just now it's in front of our face and it's amplified and it's a little bit different. But yeah. Well, let's ask, let's ask Lance this. Lance, you grew up a big Jordan fan, big Bulls fan. Is there any part of you watching this that says Michael Jordan's not the figure that you grew up loving? Well, see, I love Jordan, the basketball player, and I think that's important to note. And, and this is just my personal view on athletes overall, guys, especially when we have the conversation about Hall of Fame worthiness. This is my line. The Hall of Fame is not the Hall of Fame of perfection. Yeah. And I think sometimes we get caught up in that. If there was a Hall of Fame of perfection, nobody would be allowed in. The gates wouldn't open because yeah. there is no ideal, perfect individual. So what I think this is showing, and even growing up following him, Jordan had flaws like every other individual. He had demons like every other individual. But the one thing that separated Jordan from everybody else was what he did on the court. And that's how I've always judged and viewed Jordan. I think it's interesting to learn about, for example, the pressure of media coverage. That, I think, is quite interesting. And I think that, at least I would hope, individuals who – get so caught up in judging celebrities and athletes. What I think this sheds light on is, once again, not to shed tears over these guys and gals, okay? They make a lot of money. I'm sure they're doing quite well. But walking outside of a hotel and not having five minutes for yourself to just have a conversation in private, you know, I think it's something we all take for granted. And I think this documentary is shedding light on, Jordan was beyond the basketball player. He was an iconic figure especially back in that time. Wherever he went, mobs followed. You saw the shots at the 1992 Summer Olympics in Barcelona. Anywhere this guy went, he was demanded to sign autographs, do interviews, you name it. So, you know, that I think actually opens up a little bit more of the human element for MJ at the same time, Dex, that maybe, or Brian, to your point, it brings up people not liking him because of the gambling or some of the other aspects. So, I think we're getting our nice full circle of MJ the individual. But to me, growing up, and clearly as a teenager, as a young kid, I was not putting things in perspective right. like I have the ability to do so now about yeah. understanding the issues that he dealt with off the court. But no, to answer your question, my view of MJ does not change at all because I always knew he was the ultimate competitor. I always knew he delivered on the biggest stage. And if anything, this to me is just solidifying it at this stage. Yeah. And Dex, you say this all the time where it's like we unfairly sort of have these expectations for athletes that we don't really need to expect that much from them you know outside of the sport they play and things like that like not everyone sort of has to be this 
political representative or this no. activist and you know that's not that's not really for everybody like lebron james conversely is taking on this role and a lot of people when they compare the two they're going to say that lebron's done this he has a school he's done more charity and it's non-basketball things and you know that's a whole other discussion but i don't think it's fair to sort of expect that for everybody i think now in this day and age we kind of expect that from everybody because everyone quote unquote has a platform where we shouldn't really expect that from some people because some people just that's not who they are Right. It's just it's just not who they are. Yeah, I don't that we should retroactively force Michael Jordan to do that either. Right. No, I, I completely agree. I completely agree. Like, there's no reason we should force Michael Jordan or anybody else to do that. Like, I don't I don't think that's what should happen at all. Lance, was it was there anything specific from parts five and six that you really liked that really stood out for you? You kind of hit on one there, which I thought which really hit me which was Michael Jordan, just how alone he felt at times in his hotel room and the moments when he had to go out. That really struck me in part five. Like, it really hit me because I'm like, man, I was glad they showed that because I don't think... And I was glad you saw Jordan at that time speaking on it in 92 at Barcelona, not necessarily Jordan reflecting on it now. Was there anything else in part five or six? I'm going to get to six because I got some things to say about six, but... Um, anything that stuck out to you? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why you have things to say. Going <laughs> out on a limb here. Curious. Ninety-three Eastern Conference Finals ring a bell. But getting back to your point, yeah, I agree. I, I think it was most telling to me him in the hotel room, and that was him, I believe, in the hotel room in nineteen ninety-eight. Because remember, they were flashing. Oh, back, you were sorry. Was it was ninety-eight. You're right. At the cigar with the cigar and just sort of reflecting with the camera crew that was following the team around and saying, hey guys, you know, this is the only time that I have to myself where I could sit back and watch television because yeah. the minute I walk out of this hotel room, it's over. He's and empty. You, know, you know what was also interesting, guys? And I don't remember the name, so forgive me, but they had the Bulls PR director on. Yes. And he was also, I thought, doing a great job of putting things in perspective and maybe to spinning the sympathy angle about what the daily grind is for Michael Jordan and meeting with the media. And you see all the cameras in front of him. You know, for us that are in the locker room in a New York market, Dex, you could certainly relate to this. We've seen, you know, those huddles. But my goodness, Jordan, after every game in 98, mm. I mean, that looked like an entire army. I don't even think that's anything I've experienced in a locker room, even in wow. the New York market. So, you know, to me, that was unheard of. But him in the hotel room putting things in perspective I thought was extremely telling. And the other thing, before we get to episode six, so I'll hold off on this thought, I found it very interesting how motivated he was at the 92 finals because he was so irritated that people were comparing him to Clyde Drexler. <laughs> that I did not know. I didn't know that aided him. I knew Jordan was motivated for the minute little things, but I didn't remember necessarily that there was this media pull that Clyde and Jordan are Jordan. in the same category, and he shut every single individual up in that series. I had no idea. <laughs> I did not know of that either. And I felt bad about that the sequence that they showed in that because, I th Lance, as you know, Clyde Drexler at that time probably was the second best shooting guard in basketball. Probably. However, however, I would like to say, the gap between him and Jordan was like this. Okay? <laughs> the gap was huge. That Jordan abusing him in that finals, which he did, made Clyde Drexler look like a bum, but Clyde Drexler is no bum. That's all I'm saying. Like he's That's not why a, I posted he's the not a bum. Last night. He's Clyde Drexler <laughs> was not a bum, but Jordan sure made him look like a bum. And I do think that was great, Lance, because I did not know that. That was new for me. I did not know. I didn't even know that was a narrative. I had no idea that was out there. Neither did I. I didn't remember that at all. And it was hysterical. You have Magic Johnson talking about he and Jordan are at Jordan's house the night before game one. And MJ's telling him while they're playing cards, he's going to embarrass Clyde Drexler. And to his credit, what did he do? He went out there and he hit the six threes in the first half. And the rest is history. So... That, to me, is also what separates guys Jordan from everybody else. Forget the stats. Yeah. Forget the titles. Every time this man set out to quiet anybody or yeah. silence anybody, you're going to be hard-pressed to find an opportunity where he didn't deliver. And that's how crazy the mind of Jordan was compared to any other athlete that I think we've even seen to this day. 
I look, and again, I, I'm saying this on this podcast as somebody who grew up hating the Bulls, <laughs> hating the Bulls. Lance is right. I, I saw this guy do this to my team. We're going to get to that in a second. Lance is Lance is I can't absolutely wait. Lance is. I know you can't wait. Lance is absolutely <laughs> right. I've never seen the mental fortitude of an athlete um, in a team sport like like Jordan. You know, some people may say Tiger when he was in his prime, and I think that's arguable. Or even some athletes like Serena, and that's fine, and that's arguable. But Jordan, <laughs> Floyd Mayweather, yeah. But but the mental toughness that Jordan showed. Time and time again, you're right, Lance. He just delivered time and time again. Now, speaking of delivering, oh, and I, you know what? I'm going to do something on this podcast that I actually talked with my best friend today about. We both we grew up longtime Knicks fans, so I'm, we're going to go to the 1993 Eastern Conference Finals. And I, Lance, if you're watching the video, of this you'll see Lance is smiling already because he knows. And Lance and I have had this conversation years ago in my car, in which I told him that in Game Five of the 93 Eastern Conference Finals, I thought Charles Smith got fouled. Okay, and I held on to that. I held on to that anger for a long time, long time. I thought he got fou- fouled to the point I've met Charles Smith, who's a University of Pittsburgh alum, and I wasn't too thrilled about meeting him. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. Watching that, I have to say, it's good defense, man. It's good defense. <laughs> Wow. It's good defense. Wow. We're going to have to just have an entire podcast with that. (laughs) Forget the rest of the show. I didn't know that was going to happen. That Charles Smith was not fouled? No. The light. 27 years after the fact, Dex has finally finally seen the light. Wow. You know know what makes me upset about it more is that he should have went up stronger. And if if I'm being objective about it as a basketball fan, I watched it. And the strip... Uh, by Jordan on the second attempt, and then he goes over to the the left side of the basket and goes up, and I really, I used to think the third attempt was definitely a foul. I argued that for the longest time. Pippen gets a really good amount of the ball. I don't think there was enough body. I can understand why the refs didn't call it there. And looking back objectively and not being salty about it as it was for so many years, I looked at it last night, and I ran it. I watched it. I tortured myself, and I watched the play (laughs) three times. And I was like, you know what? That was some good defense. That was some <laughs> – I got to give it up. That was some good defense. There you go. Now, wow. now did, did we did we catch a break the next year with uh, Hugh Holland swallowing the whistle with Hubert Davis? Okay. Yeah, that, you know, I know that I know that happened too. See, Lance, we can evolve. I'm not talking to you like the when I, when I was 24. I, I, I've grown a little bit. <laughs> I've grown a little bit. Now – Oh, I, you've become a different person, it seems. I, I, maybe I have. Maybe I have. The Sports Walk is back. Watch season three of Backpack Broadcasting's original web series that brings you the opinions of real sports fans. The first two seasons and current season are available now for viewing on the Sports Walk YouTube channel and Facebook page. Check out the 2017 NYC WebFest official selection and see what other sports fans have to say on the hottest issues in sports today. It's easy. Just take the Sports Walk. Brian, so you know, yes, it does not mean that when I'm watching this part, six part, and I knew where they were going with this, and I will say, I like that the documentary gave the Knicks their due as a challenger, right? As the biggest competition to the Bulls at that time. And Jordan even respected them. But then yeah. Jordan, Jordan had to hurt me with one quote. I'm going to let Lance talk after this quote. <laughs> Jordan said, at our best, even when they were at their best, talking they being the Knicks, we still knew we were, the, they, we were the better team. And I was like, that hurts, but it's true. It hurts because it's true. <laughs> it hurts because even when the Knicks were at their best, 60 wins that year in 1993, up 2-0 in the conference finals, Brian, I thought we were going to the finals. If Lance knew me then, he didn't know me then, but if Lance knew me then at 10, 11 years old, I thought we were going to the finals. I saw Nick fans tweeting out that they really thought they were going to win oh, that series. Oh, we did. All of I us did. That. All yeah. of us did. All of us thought we were going to win that series. And watching I can't it, even imagine that. <laughs> watching they it didn't is, learn their lesson. That's the problem. <laughs> they were, but the Knicks, wait, to be clear, though, the Knicks were a number one seed, right, that they year? Were, and were they, they a 60-win team? 60 wins. And the That's Bulls true. were, like, second, third seed or something like that? Yep. Yep. Wow. And, and, and the, the Knicks won the first two games. 
And the game that really has to bother you if you're the Knicks fan is in game five. See, if you've matured as a Knicks fan, the game that should bother you is game three. Mm. Jordan still shot, I think, really badly in the game. I can't remember yeah, exactly. Was which. three of 18. Three of 18. Game. Three of 18. Mm. Lance, you would remember. Three of 18 in that game, and the Knicks wow. still lost. If they had wow. won game three, they take the series by control. They probably don't lose a game five at Madison Square Garden, but... That's what he wrote. How was it for you rewatching that, Lance? Did were you smiling at the TV? Were you like me, rewinding the plays of Charles Smith? Uh, what were you doing during that moment? It was lovely. I was once again on top <laughs> nine. Nothing makes me feel better about myself than watching Nick fans be miserable in the play. Okay, let me get it out here. Let me throw out one of my favorite statistics. I know this is going to kill Dex, but I'm still going to say it. Oh, Lord. The Bulls with MJ. With MJ. Okay, that's the key operating phrase. Face the Knicks five times between the late 80s and the 90s. Yep. And you know how many times the Knicks won a series? Zip. Zero. Zip <laughs> okay? Zero. Five and oh, the Bulls went against the Knicks. The only time the Knicks won, of course, is what Dex was referring to. The following year, Jordan retires, and they went into the semis, not the Eastern Conference Finals. A lot of people keep throwing out the Knicks played the Bulls in the Eastern Conference no. Finals. They didn't. The Knicks then played the Pacers in the Eastern Conference Beat them Finals. Seven. That's when Ewing is running around the garden, high-fiving everybody in the front row. When they Great were moment. The Great moment. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Well, also a short-lived moment because he certainly wasn't high-fiving anybody in Game 7 against the Houston Rock. <sighs> Thanks, but man. We'll save that for another podcast. Anyway, getting back to my point here. So, that was the only time the Knicks won, and that was because of the Hubert Davis, Scottie Pippen, Phantom foul. So Jordan and the Bulls, was it hard-fought series after series? Absolutely. But Jordan had the Knicks number, and the stats and the visual evidence shows that. So what was I feeling last night watching that? Certainly very fond memories. I also like the fact that they brought up the 1998 All-Star game, which was at the mm, car. Yep. That's mm-hmm. how the episode started. I actually was at that game. So it was one of my greatest memories and also the second greatest memory, which has not been brought up yet. We'll probably get to that in a later episode is, of course, Jordan's double nickel at the Garden, which was also... I forgot you told me you were, I forgot you told me you were there. I watched that last week. I watched... The, my brother made me watch it last week. I still get, I, I still get <laughs> mad about that. I still get mad about that pass to Winnington to win that game. I still get yep. mad about it. It's a, it was a great pass, though. Like, he's killing us the whole game, and then he kills us with the assist. Oh. I remember going <laughs> to school the next day. That, see, MJ. see, look, look, and look at Lance. Look at Lance. He's smiling. He's reveling in the past, the pain that was caused to Dexter Henry. But see, on this podcast, the listeners, the viewers, they saw maturity. They saw a man <laughs> admit. They see you growing up. Growing up. Or hearing you grow up, too, which That's is right. just fantastic. I don't yeah. have to, you know what, you know what, Lance? I'm no longer angry. I'm no longer angry. Oh, do the Knicks still disappoint me? <laughs> yeah. But I'm not angry about it. Like, they're not going to mess up my day anymore. So that's it. See, this, this podcast should be renamed the evolution of Dex Henry. <laughs> <laughs> because it's when Dex finally came to the realization that Charles Smith was not fouled and the Bulls just have a really good defense and they put him in his place. So, you know, this is really a tremendous moment for myself to take in. I didn't know that I was going to have the honor of hearing you <laughs> come forth with me as well as the rest of the audience. Yeah. It's a special moment. No, you know what? You know what? I mean, years ago, that was not the same energy I had for Lance. And Brian Brian knows I'm a, I'm a I won't say a disgruntled Nick fan. I, I've let a lot of that anger go. Um, but Brian, I mean, knows, Brian, you know where I am even as a Nick fan. So I, I yeah, just, you're, you're kind of just resigned to the fact that they are who they are and yeah. you're just willing to live with the results at this point. Yeah, like, what? yes, you're, you're optimistic about Mitchell Robinson and RJ Barrett, but at the same time, you don't expect too much. Uh, yeah. So I think, I think you're in a safe space. I'm in a safe I, space. I, I also think that, um, well, I actually have a question about that era, like re- really quickly yeah, about go. like the Knicks. Um, were they at any point? in position to really actually get a second star when Ewing was in his prime? Because that I don't actually know. Um, no. Was there anything that was close? A a legit second star? And and Lance, you tell me if I was wrong, because you remember either as well, too. I'd say no. There was rumors. There was always rumors about the Knicks possibly getting Jordan. 
Like yeah, even with, after, uh, I remember this. It's like LeBron now. And I wonder where the th- other day the New York Post yeah. puts out a story like, "Oh, LeBron's still not ruling out New York." Right, and and, and I, I I saw I see how you look there, Lance. I saw exactly your look on your face there. You're like, oh, yeah. the, the the typical New York media BS. And part and yeah. that is true, right? It like, is. That actually yeah. is true. I remember after Jordan's retirement in ninety after ninety three, I remember talk about that. Oh, well, maybe Jordan will come to the Knicks. There was also some Reggie Miller talk at a point. It was always the people that killed the Knicks. The Knicks Reggie killers Miller. were the mm. Nick killers were gonna then come and play with the Knicks. And the, the reason the reason <laughs> The Jordan stuff I knew, I didn't know about the Reggie Miller. The Jordan stuff, stuff was a tie because David Falk was his agent and it was also Patrick Ewan's agent. So there was some okay. thought that through commonality of them both being agents, that they'd be able to bring them together. That I never bought into any of that. No, so the answer is no. The Knicks never really had a shot of getting a true star. There was point guards who were rumored, Terrell Brandon. Other people I remember reading about at that age, but yeah, they never really had a shot at a truly yeah, good second I asked star. that because I, I watched. I mean, I've I've gone back and seen that like any Knicks Bulls rivalry, like watched full games, and I'm like, damn, they need they if they had a, a true second guy, like because it wasn't Starks, it wasn't Starks, and I love Oakley, Starks, but enough. like they pro- they probably didn't really have they didn't really get those guys until they had Sprewell and Ewing, and by then you uh, Sprewell and Allen Houston, and by then Ewing was toast anyway. Yeah, I, I was going to bring up Allen Houston and Latrell Sprewell. Larry Johnson, of course, came, but he was way beyond his he was, prime. Yeah. So I wouldn't put him in that category. I forget what year it was, but I, I want to say Allen Houston, what, came over in 95 or 96? No, 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. 96. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, Ewing at that time, we're talking about 12 years into the NBA or so. 85 yeah. was his draft. Well, they were still good in 96, 97. Right. Yeah, uh, but they the, still were but, very good. Yeah, and and I, mean, I remember reading about how people were mad that Allen Houston was starting over John Starks. John Starks came people were. The bench. I think he won six man. He of won the six year man also. of the year that year. And yeah. Allen Houston, I remember him talking about how you know he struggled in New York early on, and I think the first moment that he really, I guess, you know, felt at home was the buzzer beater against the Heat. But that wasn't until you 99. know 1998, 99 season. Yep. So that was like a couple years after. I, yeah, no. and that was also the year Ewing got hurt too, and wasn't able to play in that NBA Finals. And I yeah. do, I do think the Knicks that year could have had a legit shot, but the, you know, with the Knicks, this is this is this is what happens. Now, Lance, I have to ask you because <laughs> one day, Dex, one, one day, day, one, I'm not holding all in, only to be disappointed time and time again. It's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's what I want to. This is what I want to let people know. But that's the, Knicks, Mets, Jets. That's what oh it. yeah, it yeah. absolutely is. What I would like people to know about Lance, if they do not know. Lance is not a was not a front running Jordan person. I remember when I met him, I asked him this question. I said, "Are you still down with the Bulls?" And Lance is like, "Yes." And if you ask Lance today if he's still down with the Bulls, he will tell you yes. He's still a Bulls fan. He was not just somebody who rode for the Jordan era. So I have to ask you because we had uh, Deontay Prince on last week and we talked to him about this. What do you think about the current state of the Bulls? and the direction of where the team is headed. I also am very intrigued to hear your thoughts on the current state of the Knicks and where they are headed. Okay, wow. <laughs> the two worst situations yeah, in the Eastern I Conference are. As far as the current Bulls, they just brought in two front office members. I really like their new GM. He came over from Denver. I like how Denver drafted. So I think that hopefully his ability to bring in quality players through the draft not to say that the Bulls haven't drafted quite well. I mean, I really like Larry Markkinen. I just wish that some of these guys would stay healthy. You know, mm. They've just been plagued by the injury bug. I say this time and time again. Whoever is holding the Chicago Bulls doll, okay, take the pins out, put it down, enough is enough. They the have the Knicks doll, doll too. It's not neat. Well, the, the Knicks voodoo doll has never been put down, so it doesn't matter <laughs> who you try to it, convince. For 12-13 it was, and then after that they picked it back up. <laughs> yeah, which means that they had to tie down the individual for that season just to keep them away. <laughs> doll, okay? Thank, thanks, Lance. But thanks. The, the Bulls have been plagued by the injury bug. goes back to the Derrick Rose years. It, every time mm-hmm. it looks like this team is knocking on the door, to get out of the shadow of Michael Jordan, all of a sudden, somebody critical to the team gets hurt. So yeah. I like some of the young guys. You know, Zach Levine, I wasn't critical of the Bulls for signing him because, guys, here's the thing. Chicago has not landed a premier free agent since when? You know, name yeah. me the last time a premier free agent has said, sure, I want to play for the Bulls. They went after Carmelo Anthony, and I'm glad that he didn't want to come because I'm not a huge Melo fan, and I mm-hmm. thought it would have absolutely killed the ball distribution and the teamwork that they were building and their defense. So I'm not crying over that. And 
Hal Gasol, I wouldn't necessarily label That's as That's the guy a, I was going to mention. It was him but, and Boozer, but that was – I know what you mean. Those are like B-tier guys. Correct. Yeah. I'm talking about a franchise player, a guy yeah. that you know he's going to be the guy. You know, they've toyed with players, LeBron and Wade, remember, during that beat big free agent frenzy, but I don't think that was ever serious. So if you're not going to land the big fish, then how do you build a team? It's just like the NFL. You have to do it through the draft. So I think that they made some strides in terms of bringing in some talent. Unfortunately, they haven't stayed healthy. But a guy like Zach Levine, when you give up draft assets for that player and he's still in the prime or entering the prime, however you want to label it, in a prolific scorer, what are you going to do? You're going to let him go? And then you're going to have to start all over. So for everybody that was critical, oh, Zach Levine's not worth the money. You have to start investing in these guys who are extremely young and hope they then take the next step to maybe blossom into that star. You know, just like it was when you had Derrick Rose and Jimmy Butler. Butler, people forget, Butler was a steal. Butler was a late first round pick. And then he started the playing, right? Like a true all-star. And unfortunately... There was some friction, and he wanted to move on, and Derrick Rose couldn't stay healthy, so they never really had those two guys in tandem. But I want this new GM who, like I said, has got a very good track record of drafting with Denver, and Denver's put together a nice team, mainly through the draft and trades. They didn't yeah. necessarily go out and grab a big free agent. Their biggest splash was good Paul point. Millsap, guys. Right, it's yeah. a complimentary piece. And the other thing I like about him is his ability to eye international talent which I think is extremely important in today's NBA, much more so than it was when Jordan and the Bulls were at their prime. And you got to give Jerry Krause, once again, credit to just bring it back full circle to the last dance. He found Tony Kukoc. Yep. Okay, let's not forget about that. And Tony was an excellent player in the second three-peat. Yep. They killed him in the 92 Olympics, but that was, once again, MJ the competitor wanting to give it to him, telling Jerry Krause, hey, we're not ready to hand the reins over to another player so quickly. But Tony was the sixth man in the second three-peat. He was so good at coming off the bench and providing that second scoring punch when you had to give Pippen or Jordan a breather. And I'm hoping that he's going to get his due, guys, once we start to see the second three-peat. Yes. Because yes. the story is not just right. a young Croatian kid coming into his own in the 92 Olympics. It's how he matured and developed and developed also during the year that Jordan retired. Because remember... Pippen throws the chair, refuses to go in against the Knicks. In that <laughs> I want to get to that. I want to get yeah. to that in this, in this doc. Tony, Tony hits the game winner. And if you guys remember, the Knicks went up 2-0 in that series, just like they did in 93. People forget. And the Bulls came back. They nodded that series at two. Scottie Pippen stepped over Patrick Ewing, which is the greatest dunk in the history of the NBA. <laughs> Dex. Dex, remember that. <laughs> Even though you won the series, Dex, it is the most vicious dunk in NBA history. Okay, let's review. On a fast break. Oh, really? Oh, really? <laughs> really? He then looks back at Ewing. He walks over to Spike Lee. He tells Spike Lee to shut up and sit down. And then he goes to the free throw line. I'm sorry, guys. That is epic. And it pains me to say this. It may be better than any dunk Jordan ever had against the Knicks. And Jordan had one on Ewing on the in the postseason. <laughs> He curls around Starks and Oakley. Oh, yes, all of your fans who are listening that are Knicks fans, I am here to remind you of everything <laughs> that caused pain and agony during your childhood. So don't worry. That's why they brought me on to this podcast. I am not going to let this opportunity slip away. But anyway, getting back you, to the uh, point, Hold on. Let me just stop you for a second. Do you I realize, wrote this down do you realize what you just did? You know, you don't have enough pain, Lance. And you just did a play-by-play -play of literally... <laughs> Literally one of the most painful plays I've ever experienced watching in my life. You did an exact play-by-play. -play I understand you do play-by-play. -play. That's what you do. You're, 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 you're one of the best at it. But we didn't need, we didn't need it. We didn't need it. We didn't, we didn't need that. I, I know you appreciate the kind words. We didn't need that. <laughs> All right, go on. I'm, I'm sorry, man. I'll cut you off. I'm go here ahead. to add the color to this program, not just the play-by-play. -play. Okay, so I'm trying to take you're, on You're trying to take on dual roles? Okay, gotcha. Sorry, I cut you off. I just had to let that be known. Go ahead. No, oh, I appreciate you jumping in and expressing your hardcore emotions even <laughs> to this day of what you experienced decades ago. So once again, I feel there's some promise being shown in terms of the Bulls moving on from Paxson and Foreman, handing over the reins to a new individual. I'm certainly excited about that. And like I said, my excitement is more because of the decision making he made while in Denver. And I'm hoping he, of course, can apply that to Chicago. But 
it's going to take some time and they're going to have to get healthy. I, I know it's a repeated excuse, but the truth is, if you watch the Bulls over the last few years, yes, they need to develop, but these guys also need to be on the court together. That's the problem. You're not going to gain continuity for any team if they can't play games together. How is a coaching staff supposed to develop that if you got one or two guys in the lineup, then another guy gets hurt, and you bring him back in March, and then the next guy goes out in April? So they're going to have to get over that hurdle. And that's something also the Knicks are going to have to get over, which is yeah. the second part of what you guys had posed, and I'm sure you're going to weigh in as well. The problem with the Knicks has been the lack of what I see as continuity. They've drafted players, and then what happens? And this is the problem with the Knicks. They either have a new person that comes in with a new perspective, and they trade one of the young players that you thought, oh, wait, they were just getting to the point where he was getting his feet wet, he was getting settled in, and now off you go. So my issue with the Knicks is, just like the Bulls, you can't keep dreaming about luring in the big fish in free agency. There has to be the reality check that, Nobody's coming to New York because it's the Mecca. And I'm not comparing New York to Chicago. Listen, right, even though I'm a big Bulls fan, guys, my first love is always with New York. Born and bred in Brooklyn, I will never abandon that. So you don't have to convince me about what it means to step on the court in the garden, what it means to step on the court in a New York City park. There is a stigma to that, unlike anything else, okay? But the reality is, Nobody is going to play for the Bulls because Michael Jordan suited up for them 20 years ago. Nobody's going to suit up for the Knicks because of the Ewing glory days with Pat Riley roaming the sidelines. It's just the younger players of this generation. This is the problem I have with fans. If we have to have a documentary <laughs> to teach them about Michael Jordan, do you really think they know anything about Patrick Ewing, Charles Oakley, and Anthony right. Mason? Right, and, and no disrespect to those guys. Before? Right, right. Come on. Right. No, and so also and also do they care? That's the other part of that. Of course, that's another element. Absolutely. No, that's that, they care that's fair. About somebody that played 20 years ago. And Lance, Lance you know, you know me for a long time. I'm a rational Nick fan, so I agree with everything you said. I agree with everything that, about the Bulls. Uh Brian knows I preach patience with the Knicks. Knicks fans have no patience. They want yes, you know, they want tomorrow, yesterday. They want Ola Depot and Chris Paul right now. Right as now. soon as this pandemic is over, they want both of them. So which makes no sense because I don't understand how that puts you in a better position in the long run. Chris Paul is not a long-term answer. Right. So Both have one-year contracts do? left. Yeah. Uh, I what think one-year on their contracts left. So, so yeah. you're going to win a few more games in the short term? How is that helping your team? Right. I agree. You, the point is you want to win like the Knicks did in the 90s. The Knicks yeah. didn't just toy with one year. The Knicks were a thorn in the back of the Bulls for years. That's yeah. why the rivalry grew. It wasn't just because the Bulls said, oh, this year we got to get past the Knicks. No, it was now next year we got to worry about New York too. So Chris Paul is a Band-Aid on a major issue that has taken over and encompassed the body known as the Knicks from a medical standpoint for years. <laughs> no, yeah. fair, fair enough. All right, before we let you go, Lance, um, anything you look at, what are you looking forward to in the last four parts of this documentary to bring it back to that? Well, I, as I mentioned earlier, I'm looking forward to the th second three-peat and some of the storylines and other key players, the Steve Kerr game-winning shot in Game 6 in 97 and how Jordan spoke to him on the bench to set up that play because he knew Utah was going to double him. I want people to certainly know that. Jordan, the facilitator, did exist, okay? Everybody mm -hmm. wants to talk about he's a ball hog. No, the guy had knowledge, X's and O's, the mindset to know when to get it to his teammates. Also, Rakowski and Rodman going at it. Oh, in the 96. 96. Finals. Yeah. That was tremendous. It was so entertaining. The Rodman getting Rakowski thrown out of games, the mental wars between the two. That I think is going to be great. Of course, what Jordan did in that Utah series the second time, how he finished off his career with the Bulls, I don't think you could have scripted a better ending. People forget it's not just the game winning shot. It's stealing the ball from Carl Malone, setting up the game-winning shot, and also the layup he hits to make it a one-point okay. game. So he did that all in the final 40 seconds. But here's another storyline that I'm very interested in, and it's a pet peeve of mine. I hate this narrative that Jordan was suspended, and that's why he retired from basketball. Uh, that people hmm. are selling the fact that he went to play baseball because the league basically gave him an ultimatum. The gambling is becoming an ugly eye for the NBA. You got to leave. A lot of people believe that. 
and I'm tired of hearing it. And I think actually there was some light shed on it because David Stern had a yeah. comment, the late great David Stern in the last one, and he pretty much made it clear. Rod Thorne, who worked in the NBA front office, has also said multiple times it wasn't painted as retirement, but it really was a suspension. And here's the other thing, guys. Jordan at the end of 93, which we saw following episode six, the Bulls are the height of the NBA. Jordan's the height of the NBA. They're on top of the world. What executive in their right mind who is running the NBA would go to the most well-known player in the world, not the NBA, and say, hey, you know what? We're making mega bucks, <laughs> right. doing well economically, but you know what? Take a year off because you're too much trouble. Who in their right mind from an economic standpoint would right. tell the greatest basketball player of all time to take a hiatus, take a year off, and will spin it as a retirement? So. I think it was the emotions of, unfortunately, his father's passing, which I'm assuming we're going to get to in the next episode. Yep. And the buildup of that, just like the buildup of the emotion of him just mentally getting to a point where as great as the fame was and as great as he was as a basketball player, like any individual, sometimes you need to get away and you need to clear your mind. So that is what I'm very interested in them laying out and hearing commentary from people because once again i'm tired of hearing from people who are loving the conspiracy theorists and i group all those people on an island who just <laughs> love to constantly throw out he was punished by the nba for gambling and that's what was framed as the retirement when i don't think there's any validity be behind that yeah and i think we'll see a lot of that um in episode seven eight and more upcoming because i you know he's just been uh, that's kind of been a narrative that's always shaped and around there at Lance. And so I'm glad you brought that up, but I really am intrigued to see if he will speak also about his father's death, how much he'll open up about that, because obviously that had a huge impact on his life. And I, I like you happen to think that had a huge impact on why he took a break away from the game. So that'll be very interesting to see. We're looking forward to it too. Um, Lance, we got to thank you for coming on, even though you took me down some uh, dark places in memory lane and you got to see some growth <laughs> from me and Brian got to laugh at me. Um, thanks for coming on, man. Uh, it's, it's good. You know what I got to ask you real quick before you go? Uh, sure. since you're, since you're quarantining and dealing with sports, Brian and I've been asking everybody this. Do, when do you, when, do you think sports is coming back anytime soon? Do you think you'll see a gal Dallas Cowboys lose like, you know, 15 games this year or something, or, you know, the Yankees <laughs> not win, uh, what's, what's going to go on? Uh, it's a great question, and it's something that I also ponder and talk a lot about. Here's my biggest concern, guys. What I'm concerned about is them creating an environment, not for the fans, because I think sports is going to return, and we're not going to have fans. I, I think people need to realize that, because I don't think right now it's safe to do that. I also don't think a lot of fans feel comfortable running to stadiums. So sports will return, but it's going to return in empty arenas and stadiums. Yeah. That's the first thing that I think we need to wrap our heads around. The second thing is they need to create an environment where I think the players and the coaches feel safe. And what I mean by that is there's got to be enough testing and testing as they come and go from these arenas and these stadiums, guys, where they can make sure they're monitoring the players so that whoever does come into the arena, which would be the most basic individuals needed for a game to run, that they feel that everybody is comfortable. And I don't know if we're at the point right now, and I don't want to get political and get off topic here, but I don't think right now we're at the level where the volume of testing mm -hmm. is accessible for even all professional sports leagues and colleges to that standpoint where you, know, you could test guys and gals coming and going. So we've got to get to that point. What's encouraging is the NFL season is not scheduled to start until September. Let's face it. They could always sacrifice the preseason if, God forbid, we need to. So you hopefully would get to a point where there's a lot of progress being made. I'm very leery about the NBA's game plan to, you know, try to start things up and salvage this season at some point in the summer. I don't know. I and mean, that's just, once again, that's my personal opinion. I don't I would see it, like I don't see it happening. Conclusion. But, you know, here's what I can't wrap my head around. So you're going to try to take these hockey teams and these NBA teams and put them in Vegas or put them in one location and, how are you going to control that environment, guys? That's still my concern. What happens if, God forbid, a player tests positive and then he's been exposed to everybody else on the team? Right. Are we going to now have to shut down the league again? So that's why, once again, 
I think the testing has to be to a point where you are able to contain everybody. And what I mean by everybody is all of the players. Are you going to put these players on planes and you're going to put them on chartered flights and then they're going to then go back to their families and interact with their families and then come back to the gym or whatever? Once again, if they can wrap their head around the controlled environment, yeah, I think it'll come back sooner rather than later. But I'm far more optimistic about making enough progress for the NFL season to get going than I am about an immediate continuation of some of these other sports, such as the NBA, the NHL, and even Major League Baseball starting up. Oh, good stuff. Yeah, it's going to be tough to see what we see. Thank you, man, for joining us. Talk about the last dance, Chicago Bulls, painful Nick memories. We all appreciate it. His name is Lance Meadow. You can find him on Sirius XM Radio, also Radio Voice, uh, doing pregame for the Giants uh, and some other stuff with thegiants.com, good friends and people out there, and also some play-by-play. And if you want to run back in this episode, which Brian will have clipped, Lance's great play-by-play of Scotty Pippen dunking over Patrick Ewing, which nobody really wanted to hear yes, again. I like that. <laughs> Lance, we appreciate you, man. Thank you. Hey, my pleasure. Dex, always great catching up with you. I hope you and yours continue to stay safe and healthy. Same to you, Brian. It was great to get to know you and interact with you. And if you guys want me back on, I'd be more than happy to open the old wounds in terms of the (laughs) and for continuous more and more salt into those wounds. Well, uh, now everybody knows Lance is a great guy. Thanks, Lance. Appreciate you, man. One time for your mom, one time. One time for your mom, one time. All right, one time for your mind. Haven't done this in a while, but it's the time where we talk to you a little bit about stuff that's going on in the world, things that we want to share with you that you should know about. And sometimes we like to get a little stuff off our chest, which I know Brian has to do this week. Saturday night. Let's go there. Uh, slam, slam for the win, slam FTW on Twitter. They're, you know, they've they've been doing actually a good job of just video game content they've been quick to adapt in this quarantine time they've been having call of duty tournaments they look pretty fun they post some clips uh and things of that nature so i've watched them and obviously i've written that slam before so anything that slam does is pretty much on my radar so this slam for the win count not a big account it's it's growing it has a nice following but it doesn't have what these other companies have and i'm going to get to them in a second so slam uh post basically you know a a viral clip and you should see this if you haven't seen it it's a viral clip of josh hart getting mad at his cold duty game he got killed in a way that i guess he didn't agree with and look i've been there i've played call of duty i played this call of duty a lot although i uninstalled it because it's too it's too much damn space and i'm not i'm not no it's the arrogance of that game taking up too much space on my on my uh, ps4 i'm not i'm not rolling with that but josh hart basically what josh hart did was he got mad that he got killed somehow uh unplugged seemingly unplugged a few things ripped off his keyboard i think he unplugged his keyboard now that i think about it threw it down stepped on it a few times saying fuck this game fuck this game fuck this game picked the keyboard back up threw it to the other room just darted it over there and dudes are on the on the chat just laughing and saying who was that whatever so slam uh, at Slam for the win, FTW posts this on their uh, Twitter account, obviously, as you would do, because this is a funny viral moment. Bleacher Report and ESPN, both brands we, we respect up here. Look, I have no knock against Bleacher Report or ESPN most of the time. But Bleacher Report, you know, not only do they grab the Josh Hart clip, and by the way, there is a, a logo, a Slam, you know, like a watermark right on the top left corner. They repost it and it's cropped out. It's cropped out and just says, Josh Hart snapped his keyboard. And not only do they not tag the slam page that posted it, they tag Josh Hart because they say it's via at Josh Hart. And they tag their own gaming channel at BR Gaming, which has nothing to do with this post. Guess who gets more views because they have a, a platform with a bigger audience? Bleacher Report does. ESPN, the same thing. Josh Hart smashes keyboard after dying in Call of Duty. The same emoji, too, with the red face. Um, at ESPN underscore esports via Josh Hart. The same exact thing, pretty much. Hmm. And both of these accounts with bigger platforms, and this is what I'm this is the ultimate point in all this. So I basically, because they ripped it off the stream or whatever, I basically said, I'm confused. Isn't this a slam post? Like what's going on here? Rhetorical question, but why are ESPN and Bleach Report not only reposting this for engagement, air quotes, 
uh, but they're also tagging their own gaming channels, which have nothing to do with the original post from the Slam tournament. This is a Slam post, right? It's via Josh Hart because, yes, he was on the stream also, but it's a Slam tournament, and the Slam logos are cropped out of this post. You understand what I'm saying? I understand so, clearly what you're saying. So basically, I, I go on to say, like, this is an algorithm game. This is, this is what it is. It's the way everyone seemingly has to play it. Otherwise, nothing pops off for them. It's so corny. All they want to do is clip things, put their own thing on it, um, put their own logos to make sure that their brand gets pushed and not credit the original creators of this content. Josh Hart never even posted this clip. Never posted it on his page, by the way. Right. He actually, he actually saw some posts. He saw my Instagram post, which is pretty funny because I actually scrolled to see who looked at it, and it was Josh Hart because I reposted it. I left the Slam logo because it is Slam content. Josh Hart never posted this on his page. He just posted that he was about a stream. He didn't post that he was that he went ballistic and all this stuff. So you know, it's just rinse and repeat. Slam creates the content. The bigger brand's jacket with no acknowledgement. Uh, didn't tag the correct source and who gets the bigger following, who gets more clicks, it's the bigger brands. And that's just to let everyone know that these bigger brands, a lot of them, they're not really innovative. They're not changing the game. They just have more followers in a bigger platform. What a lot of people do with 10,000 or 5,000 followers, they steal from people like us. They steal from people like Dexter. They steal from people like me. And it influences the way they tweet. I've seen people with 10,000, 15,000 uh, on their on their Twitter account, tweet something after I tweet it, and it get and it goes, you know, it, it it just goes more because they have a bigger following. People are ripping off people with smaller accounts all the time because they think they could get away with it. And we're gonna be calling this out now. You know what I mean? Like I'm just tired of it. I'm just fucking tired of it. And shout out to the people at Slam for the win because they followed me and we actually talked about this the next morning. Well shout out to Slam for the win uh, uh about that. Um actually intriguing something that I'll talk to you about this off but something that I might have to bring up around that that needs to be done. Sounds like a sideline story in the making. Mm. Anyway, I, what I will say to that, what Brian said is that um, this is not nothing thing that's new. I think the thing that gets dangerous with this is this happens a lot on social media. When it comes to wild, things, wild when here, it comes man. to things on on uh, regular or traditional media or even on people's websites. They actually know that they can't play the game like that. So ESPN and Bleacher Report know that if they were actually putting this up on their websites right. in their media players, they wouldn't be able to do that while cropping it out because they know definitely Sam will come after them because they're getting ad revenue for that. Those are the reasons why you can't come at someone in that way. However, people do this on social media, as you call it the wild, wild west, and they just think they could do whatever they want. Kudos to you for calling it out because it was the right thing to call out. And more people should call out these big outlets for doing this. Well, that's the problem. Not enough people do, and that's how people continue to get away with the shit. But look, man, I, I don't care. I'm not tied to any brand in that way. Right. I don't have, I, I'm not, I, you know what I mean? Like, I'm tied to this podcast. I will, you know talk, I, like, I will share this with people because I don't want to make it sound like this is a new thing or this is a social media thing. I will never forget this. I was at the Knicks Bowl in 2012. This is at the height of Lynn's sanity. Mm. The height of Lynn's sanity. And I'm at this Knicks Bowl and I was shooting stuff, and I believe I was doing stuff. I don't remember who I was covering it for. Doing, I think I was doing it for Backpack. I actually did it for Backpack. And I had all this footage, and I came home, and I edited this video at night, and I put this video up on the next ball. Go check out the Backpack Broadcasting YouTube channel. It's still there. Thanks to one person who was like Brian, one person who decided to call something out because it was wrong. Somebody left a comment on my video and alerted me that somebody else had taken my Backpack video Cropped out my logo, because mm -hmm. I had learned when I was younger, always put your watermark on there. Cropped mm -hmm. out my watermark and tried to put the video on their own. And this video did a good amount of views overnight. It did crazy. Like, for me, it did, like, 8,000 views or something for YouTube at the time. This person then had, like, six or 7,000. So they basically stole views away from me, and they acted like the content was there. So I messaged the person. I wasn't going to let that slide. And I was like, what's right. up? What's up, man? You know you didn't make this video. You know it's my video. Oh, man, I was just saying I thought I could share it. I said, oh, well, I'm just saying I'm going to report you to YouTube. That's what I did. Now, I don't know if YouTube did anything with the person, but I reported it. They said they was going to look into it, and I guess he took the video down. But people been out here trying to steal people's stuff. Minorities know that. Mm. <laughs> we did know that. So, you know. This is America. <laughs> out here trying to do that, that's not cool. And I support Slam. And I don't know if Slam made a big deal out of it and, and maybe want to protect some relationships, but that's not cool. You know you didn't do that content. You know you didn't do the content. 
Give Slam the credit. And to, ta- and, the, and to tag your own gaming channel. That had nothing to do with just because you want to get your gaming channel some followers. And people are so stupid that what probably happened from there is they followed those gaming channels. Because they think that that gaming channel is going to have content. When really Slam is just getting these people to partake in these tournaments off the strength. Donovan Mitchell's been doing them. Ben right. Simmons has been the doing world. them. LeBron James' son. All these kids. If ESPN and Bleacher Report did that, they would have to pay those dudes. It's yeah. a different game, yo. It's a different game when you just have respect. And at the end of the day, respect travels further than anything else. Period. All right. It does, but not everybody has that level of respect. All right, my one time for you, mind kind of ties back. I've been finding a lot of stuff around this COVID-19 pandemic and stuff that I find more and more ridiculous all the time. Now, in Oklahoma, Texas, some of these states that have opened back up, Brian, you have movie theaters, Okay. <sighs> Movie theaters. Let's talk about movie theaters. You know the last place I want to go right now, Brian? A movie theater. I'm not I don't even to... go to movie theaters when they're open. <laughs> I'm not a movie theater guy. I'm just f- fine. Well, then this isn't yeah. for you. But theaters in Oklahoma and Texas are preparing to reopen, and they're preparing to reopen with TSA-style check-in, temperature screenings, and plexiglass, all to protect you. Let me explain something to people. If you don't do this, maybe you do this for work, maybe you don't. I get to travel a decent amount for my job, right? Who knows how many flights I'm hopping on a year. But between the months of September and March, I travel a good amount for work. And if you have TSA pre-check, or like I've clear like I do, you get to skip some of the line stuff and get through it a little bit quicker. But you know what nobody really wants to do when they fly? Go through TSA screening. Although we all (sighs) understand that we live in a world that we have to go through TSA screening. But nobody wants to do that. Now, the thing when I read this article, and this was written by Ryan Latanzio of IndieWire. And I was like, wow, this is really interesting that all this stuff. And I'm not going to go into all the details for the sake of time, but I kind of mentioned to you what these theaters are doing. One question popped into my mind, Brian. One question. And I just kind of alluded to it with the fact that I don't even want to go through the TSA when I'm flying. Who the hell wants to do this when they're trying to go to the movies? It's not worth it. Why would why would I want that experience of going like, to the movies? Why? At some point, at some point, what's the hassle for? You know what I mean? Like we, I mean, we were just talking to Lance about like what's it going to take for sports to come back at this point? And again, I'm just going to say the same thing I've been saying. It's a little too soon for that right now, just generally speaking. And we're all in agreement with that. I think once you start rattling off the variables of what it would take for people to have a good experience and for to be able to do an event and do something like pandemic aside, right? The pandy aside. If you're just talking <laughs> stop it. <laughs> like if you're just talking about anything in general, like if if I invite you Dex to a party and nope. I'm like, "Yo, nope. here's the thing. You have to go to Staten Island. You have to go here. It's in the middle of here. You have to make sure you don't, you know, drive this way because you got to go here." And I just start rattling off all these variables that are just inconvenience to you, right? They're just an inconvenience to you. You're going to be like, "Yeah, I'm not. Yeah, it's just too much." Like just in general. Now you throw in the fact that there's a pandemic everywhere and we still don't really know. We still we're still learning about this thing like on a daily basis. It's like, "Yo, what's the point?" And but aside from that, it's like, yo, what are you going to see in the movie theater that you can't watch on like Netflix or something right now at this point? Well I, mean, well, I mean, there goes, there goes your point. A lot of this for people is about money. And I wonder how much of all this stuff just changes how we look at the movies and stuff. Because some movies have opted to actually bring their their movies directly home, right? Like some theaters have actually, have films have actually done that. Like I just, a couple weeks ago, we bought Trolls for my daughter. And she's enjoyed that movie and got to watch it yeah, at home. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was fun. We paid the 20 bucks and we watched it at home and it was cool. You know, and that's, that's fine. fine yeah. But you know the reason? It's always about money. This was from, let me see who the person this is. This is one of the people that runs. This is the CEO, Michelle Roberts of Evo Entertainment in Texas. She said, quote. Oh, not the MVP. Not the MVP. <laughs> no, Michelle Roberts. <laughs> I feel like it's important for our guests to come in and see what they're doing to protect them. The focus is on earning that customer confidence back. And you know what I... It's not that important. You know, no, no, no. You know what the problem I have with that? You know what the fo- yeah. You know when the customer confidence will be back? When the pandemic is over and there's a yeah. vaccine. <laughs> That's when the customer confidence will be back. Not because you said to come back. Not because you want to make some money. Because people actually feel safe. And Lance kind of hit on this. With yeah. fans coming in the thing. And this is why I think it ties in. He said... I don't think fans are going to be comfortable with coming into a space. He's right. You know when people are going to be comfortable? 
when there's a vaccine and they never have to think about the words coronavirus and being around other people again. That's yeah. just the reality of it, but nobody wants to accept that, especially in some of these southern states. Open Look, up theaters this soon and then this way, bad idea. I don't know about you, but when they say we can go outside, I still ain't going outside. I'm giving y'all about two weeks. I'm going to let all the white people that want to reopen the economy go outside first. Let them be the test dummies for this. And if they're sick in two weeks, then I'm going to keep my ass inside. If they're good, then all right, maybe I'll go to the store or something. A lot of people, a lot of people uh, they can't wait to get back outside. I hear it from a lot of people. I've been hearing it from some people in certain places. I'm and good, um, here's the thing. I'm getting, I'm, get, I'm getting work done. Like, I'm good. I'm, 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 you know what I'm good with? being healthy and we hope that everybody else is too all right that's it for episode 126 mostly. of the ain't hard to do. mostly healthy most of you guys. <laughs> episode 126 of the ain't hard to tell podcast remember stay home stay safe listen to ain't hard to tell podcast you know where to find us on twitter facebook on instagram as well at ahtt podcast uh please continue to support us as we have been trying to bring you great content through these quarantine times for brian fonseca i'm dexter yep. Henry. until next time y'all Peace.